Uh, my name is Andrea Kumba, and I have the great privilege of being the, the relatively new director, of, uh, chief executive of the Howard League. Uh, I'm very sorry that my first in conversation uh, event in this job uh, comes on such a sad day for the Howard League, uh, which is today, Tuesday, 22nd of February, 2022, uh, is the final day of our brilliant legal director, Laura James, who's been with us uh, for 16 years. Um, from the outset, I want to make it clear that this event was my idea, not Laura's idea. Uh, she's pretty horrified. <laughs> um, she wanted this to be about an opportunity to, to introduce the legal team beyond her. Um, and I think that's a terrific idea and we'll certainly do that in the future. Um, but I'm sure that you'll all agree with me that it's right um, uh, that we mark her years of service uh, with our lawyers network and other supporters by speaking about Laura, her time at the Howard League, how the landscape's changed, and her thoughts on the future for youth justice. Um, I'm gonna to chat to Laura for about 25 minutes, during which time I would ask that you put questions you have for her into the Q&A box, um, and then we'll have 20 minutes at the end for your questions. Um, please use the chat box for general messages of love and support and appreciation <laughs> uh, or anything else you wanna come up with, and um, that would be great. Um, we're going to record um, see, there's one already. Thank you, Mary. Um, we will record this event and we're going to put it onto our YouTube channel up until the Q&A bit. So the Q&A part won't form part of, of that. Um, so, Laura, uh, let's start by talking. This is your, your final day at the Howard League. Do you want to tell us about your first day at the Howard League and how you came to, to be with us? Well, it was such a long time ago. I don't think I can even remember my first day at the Howard League. I was a lot younger than I am now as a trainee solicitor. I actually transferred to the Howard League during my training contract from um, a legal aid firm in Halsden where I was doing county court work and police station work, the police station till midnight, getting injunctions in the morning at, at seven or whatever. Um, and, um, and really uh, all throughout that, I suppose my, my heart really was about kind of trying to create change. So during that time, I'd set up the Young Legal Aid Lawyers, which was about access to justice and creating networks of support for, for lawyers who wanted to do social welfare and legal aid work. And um, I'd also, before being a, a lawyer, also been very interested in human rights, particularly um, human rights people in Burma. But during my time working at Doughty Street Chambers with Ed Fitzgerald, I came to realise that there was a whole lot of work that needed to be done right here at home, particularly with people in prison. So when an opportunity came up to work at the Howard League with Chris Callender was the director at the time, legal director, I jumped at it because um, it seemed to me it was a way to bring together lots of my interests, including yeah, access to justice for children in prison. You, you couldn't get a group that were less disenfranchised than that. So that's why I came my first day. I can't remember. I'm sorry. Sorry, I should have muted myself. And, and what, what did the landscape look like? I mean, what was the work of the Howard League at the time? What was the, the environment like for, for children in prison? So this year marks 20 years of the legal service at the Howard League. So we started off before my time in 2002 with the um, Children Act case, which was brought by the organisation, um, something that, that Francis Crook really kind of pushed and worked with um, colleagues to bring a case in our own name to say that the rights afforded to children under the Children Act should not simply dissipate at the prison gate. And we won that. And I think that set the tone of the work actually until this very day. And a lot of what we've been doing has been about reinforcing that message. And so in the early years at the Howard League, um, a lot of the work was about building on that and taking cases right up to the House of Lords, as it then was, Court of Appeal, High Court, um, to try and extend, stretch, nuance the rights that children in custody were entitled to from social services. And we use that work, that, that is an area of law that has matured as a result of that work. And we use that every day um, still. The, the team use it all the time to get outcomes for children. But the children in prison at that time, we were only representing children under 18 in custody. And there were 3,000 of them at any one time. Um, so just to sort of put that in, in sort of terms throughout the year, there were 10,000 children going through the prison gates in any given year. And a lot of our work 
at that time was was with the girls. So there were a number of girls units um, which were housing, I'll use that word carefully, 17 year old girls in adult women's prisons in specialist units. And I just remember waking up regularly, just terrified that that there was such high levels of self-harm and self-injury amongst that population, just terrified that the particular young the, the girl that I was working with at the time just wouldn't even be there the next morning and being relieved even when they were calling me again in crisis on the advice line just relieved to hear their voice um so you know that is a real change um the landscape now is completely different and um, there are less than 500 children in prison today uh, there's a tiny handful of girls unfortunately and maybe we can come back to this later there are now for the first time in many years those those prison units housing girls closed many years ago um, but as of last year there are now girls being held in um, Weatherby prison and not only is that girls in prison service accommodation but it's girls in a boys prison so that's very regressive but I suppose the big the biggest regressive thing that's happened is that that you would have thought with the numbers decreasing by 70% numbers of children decreasing by 70%, there would be a commensurate increase in the care and attention and the treatment of those children. And that hasn't happened. Actually, um, since the urgent notification system came in, um, where the chief inspector can alert the Secretary of State to a prison that really needs urgent action taken, three of those nine notifications have been about children's prisons. And that's three of the last four. And what's the problem, do you think, there? I mean, where are the, the key obstacles to a constructive time in prison for these kids? Well, first, first of all, we've known for years that prisons are just not ever going to cater properly for children's needs. When I first started working at the Howard League, there were about um, over 200, about 230 or 50 places for children in secure children's homes, which if you do have to lock children away, that's where they stand the best chance of getting some proper care attention. With people who are qualified and want to work with children, local authority runs small units. Now, if you think about it, if they had not decommissioned so many places in those homes, we would have over half the children's prison population now in those homes. Instead, what's happened is many of those homes have been decommissioned, places reduced. And so there's just over 100 places in secure children's homes. And most children are still in the YOIs, which surprisingly, of course, is still not fit for purpose. There's been some good developments, the health and wellbeing teams across YOIs. But ultimately, over the, especially over the last two years, my team and I have been talking to children on our advice line every day who are in places that look like and smell like prisons and and they're spending often uh, 20 plus hours a day in their cells um, and not getting education um, or, or proper developmental experiences and and that's time you can just never get back when you take that away from a child and and do you want to tell us a bit about the work beyond children because we also do a lot of work on young people yeah so um so in, I think it was around 2009, we extended the legal service to include um, young adults. So, um, and because of the way the prison system works, that was 18 to 21 year olds, just because of the practicalities of the system. So um, absolutely, I know that, you know, the evidence now is really clear that, of course, we know from our own experience, children do not wake up on their 18th birthday as fully fledged adults. That's not happening. But what we know scientifically is that children's brains are still developing well into their mid-20s, if not beyond that. Um, and so what we could see was that young adults just didn't know what hit them when they moved into the adult prison estate. Um, they were effectively just treated as older adults um, with absolutely no additional care and attention and support. And actually that's still largely the case today, a very small proportion of young adults in custody are in specific accommodation um, and so a lot of our work is with that group who are sort of stuck in between um, you know they, they, they are often retaining all the difficulties and vulnerabilities of childhood with none of the support and in an adult world so that's a hugely important 
part of our work and we've been working it's been brilliant to work with the transition to adulthood alliance over the last decade to really try and change um policy and practice in that area but but also what's been a huge privilege i think for, for myself and i think many members in in the team as well is just the theory was very clear it's been clear for a long time but to see it you know i've got clients now that i've worked with for over a decade some of them you know when i was talking to you last week we were so, so noticing that actually we've been working together for almost half his adult life for half his life not just his adult life and you see it you see that change you see the maturity kick in you see um them, them starting to reflect and to um a, and to find their way in the world and to grow out of crime um because you know, the theory is true, it happens. And that's been a, a huge privilege to, to try and help and support some of these young, young adults along the way. And what are you, like, if you look back, I mean, not, it's to be clear, like, Laura's not dying. <laughs> She's not retiring for good. She's just moving on to like slightly different job. Um, so we have to keep reminding ourselves not being executed at dawn. But but when you reflect on that that period of time and those, those changes, um, and and your impact like what are the things that you're most proud of I mean I, th I think you know I was, I was talking to our legal aid contract manager the other day and just sort of saying saying goodbye um, and we were just sort of talking about how the fact we are still the only frontline legal service that works with children um, particularly and, and also young adults in custody no one else does that and it's such a it's something I think that we've really in the team, you know, with over 30 years, um, you know, time clocked up at the Howard League with, you know, Claire and Sinead, the senior lawyers who'll be handling everything when I'm when I'm gone have each got over a decade and, and through to Adriana, who's our new Justice First um, fellow, who's literally just joined us this year, you know, incredible um spread of experience. And but the expertise that's needed to really bring together the kind of particular issues that affect young people, whether it's the maturation stuff I was just talking about, whether it's the Children Act duties, um, no, nobody else does that. And I'm really proud that that we are doing that. And we're still learning. We're um, One of the things that we're working on at the moment is um, looking and working jointly with IPSI, um, Special Educational Needs Charity, um, about looking at children's education rights in custody. Um, and there's just, there's so much that can be done to really um, transform young people's experiences in, in what is obviously going to be one of the hardest situations in their lives. So I'm very proud of that. Um, I am I'm proud of the young people that I've had the privilege to work with who've really taught me so much and, and, and you know, allowed me into their lives and, and, and allowed me to help them. I'm really proud of the participation work that we did. So we did a project which was funded by the lottery um, back, well, probably about 10 years ago now it started and it was called You Are Boss. And um, the name came from something that I always say to clients and still say to clients, in fact, said it to a young person today, you are my boss, you can sack me. We're the only person in your life who is an optional extra. We are here for you. You know, every other professional you probably you know, if you know what's good for you, you're going to want to listen to them and be polite. You can hang up on me. You can sack me. Um, and and so the thing about the participation project, not only did it make a huge contribution to the literature of um, criminal justice research. And when I was studying for my doctorate, you know, all the kind of research on participation of children in the criminal justice system was was actually from your boss, which was great. Um, but it's transformed the way we've worked. So we've really embedded that into our culture in, in the legal team of listening to children and young people's voices and feeding that through into the wider work of the organisation. Um, Maybe, you can, I mean, that's one of the things that is, I think, fantastic about the Howard League, certainly attracted me to it, is the, the fact that we have these clients um, and people who call it the advice line, and that gives a richness to the policy and campaigns work. I mean, you've been really critical in connecting those two. Yeah, I think I think that is really important. I think it, it's quite unique. And I think um, just you know, being in a position to um, go, go to 
kind of policy meetings or stakeholder meetings and be able to actually bring children's voices in the room from the wealth of experience that you just have from listening to children all day, every day, is, is really important. And the insights that young people can provide you are just, you know, there's nothing better, really. Um, you know, one, one of the young people I worked with, I never, he had a quite a significant learning disability just remember never forget he turned around to one day and just said well everyone knows you stay the age you're coming at and actually it's true you know he went in at 15 I think he was about 19 when he said that and it always helped me to make sure that I represented him properly by holding in mind the 15 year old young person not just the 19 year old man getting hairier and hairier before me <laughs> Yeah, Lisa, you don't have sons to enjoy that. It's <laughs> um, that's your proudest moments, but what about your biggest disappointments? I mean, what do you, are the things that you look back on and think, damn. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> I'm I mean, I'm really, really disappointed with what I began with, that, that we have decreased yeah. the number of children we lock up and not increased the care and attention that we give them. I am absolutely scandalized by the fact that when when I first started um there were around 20 percent of children in custody were from black and ethnic minority communities um in custody and now it is over half five years on from the Lamy review it's worse than it ever was um and so although I'm really proud of the anti-racist guide for lawyers that we produced last year and that was an amazing experience and the fact that my entire team is really cited on that and having difficult conversations with young people and doing what they can to, to raise those issues um the fact is a, as a community as an organization we've not been able to sort of turn that round I think is a, is a huge disappointment and but I hope it won't be for long I'm sure that that is something that, that the Howard League will continue continue to focus on because it's so important I'm obviously devastated um, about the uh, Supreme Court judgment in AB um, you know what are human rights for if they are not going to protect a 15 year old child from being kept in a cell the size of a car parking space for 23 and a half hours a day for 55 days in a row um, yeah. so you know we, we'll have to see what what the Strasbourg court says about that and I will be be watching that with care but I'm also heartened by the fact that one of the amazing things about working at the Howard League is you don't just do the case you, you talk to people and not only um you know has it meant that case has given the team a lot of knowledge and a lot of young people have been taken out of solitary confinement on individual complaints um that that we've made on behalf of people but uh, when I went to Feltham it was really clear that, that they had completely changed their culture and practice as a result of that case. Um, as a result of that case, Her Majesty's Inspector of Prisons had issued a, a thematic review. There is now a task force on solitary, on separation, they call it, um, in the Ministry of Justice and the Royal College of Psychiatrists, the British Medical Association, the Royal College of Pediatrics have all you know, come out and said, this is not okay, as has the Joint Committee on Human Rights. So, you know, although, although we didn't win the case, as it were, it, it has created a lot of change on the ground, which is obviously a bit harder to see during, during COVID, but I'm hoping as we get into March and the transition period ends, um, we, we can really start to see some of the benefits of that. I mean, anybody who knows you, and I think there are lots of people who have joined us today who, who do, um, would know that you are an incredibly positive, cheerful person. Um, how, how do you deal with the daily, I mean, I know it's a slog, there's a lot of sadness and despair every day on the advice line, if not generally in the work. I mean, how, how have you found your way to process that? Well, anyone who knows me knows that that will be through hard partying and extreme sports. Um, no, <laughs> um, it's it. I'm, I'm afraid it's, you know, I think vicarious trauma of the work we do is something that we've been conscious of for a very long time. Um, it's something that the 
legal community is really switching on to claiming space, um, which came out of two members of, of my amazing Wailau committee have set up and support the legal community with that. Um, legal Education Foundation doing a huge amount, Legal Action Group published a book by, by, by Rachel and Joe Fleck on that. Um, I think it comes back down again to the team, to talking to each other. We, we have a lot of shared experiences um or we, you know obviously it's been much harder during lockdown but we've had to find ways to make sure that we debrief that we talk to each other that we share experiences um but it's you know there's no some of this stuff is really tough of course it is incredibly distressing um my way my personal way of dealing with it is knowing that that i'm doing what I can, I'm doing something practical to try and make it better. I don't think I could be an immigration lawyer in the current environment, you know, we, we, though what we do is really tough, a lot of the time we can make a difference to our clients and to their outcomes, and at least they feel heard and listened to. Um, not all areas of law are like that. Um, so I think the fact that we can still try and make a difference and work together on it is, is the biggest aid. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what the legal team's got coming up, just as a taster. Sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so all sorts of things. I mean, legal teams as as busy as ever. One of the things that's amazing is the team. Li literally on the twenty fourth of March, twenty twenty, prison service went into lockdown, and on the twenty fifth of March, we were running a remote service. No one had ever worked from home before. It was it was incredible. There was no disruption, and I can't say that for the the rest of the secure estate where you know education stopped even advocacy um, struggled to get in for a long time. So um, so busy as ever doing the advice line stuff. Um, we've been working on remand. So um, Sinead's doing some amazing work on that, um, really looking at the unnecessary use of remand, thinking um, we, we published a briefing in September, what's wrong with remanding children to prison. Um, Soon we'll be publishing um, a briefing, which is the second part of that, which is about the voices of children we worked with at Feltham um, on, on remand. Um, we're then going to take that to the next level, uh, working with a, a colleague of, our, of ours at Garden Court, who's going to help us to uh, produce a sort of how-to guide to help lawyers and practitioners to do everything they can to stop children being remanded in the first place and to get them out when they are remanded so that's a very exciting stream of work um, we're also thinking about complaints um, I think one of the things I said earlier that's a real disgrace is about the the terrible discrimination in custody and one of the things that really saddens me is that in all the years that I've worked I've never known a discrimination complaint to be upheld yeah. um, and I think that then you know we need to create a culture change um, and we've got to do that by supporting young people to make complaints. Now we have to do that with care because um, sometimes that can be really traumatic, especially if you know um, that they may not get what the outcome they want, but um, it's really important that we try and um, we, we try and empower children to be able to do that. And I know the prison probations ombudsman is still very concerned that she doesn't get enough complaints from children. And a lot of them just come via us. So I was going to say, most of a good chunk of them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've already mentioned looking at education rights of children in custody. So in 2014, the Children and Families Act introduces a whole raft of um, rights for children in custody, especially children with uh, special education needs. Um, and they're just not being realised or used. So we're working with IPSI to try and produce a briefing that will hope, which will hopefully um, support practitioners to, to make sure those rights are realised and become alive and meaningful and help children challenge them when they don't get them. Um, so just a few things that we are that we're working on. And please, members of the audience, start putting your questions in. Um, do you want to tell us what your next plans are that you can tell us about? Well, um, nothing very exciting, really. I'm going to be continuing to um, work with my uh, cohort of children, young people and other vulnerable clients across various different detention settings in my other practice, which is um, at Scott Moncrief and Associates and GT Stewart. Um, my passion for youth justice is absolutely not going anywhere. Um, so, um, so I'm you know, I, I'm still going to be watching the amazing work of the Howard League from afar and um, very much hoping to continue to write and um, be part of debate and discussion in this area.
Thank you everyone for coming for your questions. Uh, have a safe night. Laura, we love you. Goodbye. Thank you.